Okay, welcome. For this uh, particular lecture, we are going to be focusing on asexual reproduction and chromosomes and a few other terms. Okay, to start off, we are going to talk about asexual reproduction really only requires one parent to produce offspring. So there are some examples. Make sure you know these. It will be on your quiz. And for your quiz, you will not be able to use your notes as you had the option in the past. So make sure you study this information. And the questions will only come from the lecture, not from the reading. So for asexual reproduction, there are a couple different examples. You have budding and fragmentation. So when a fragmentation occurs, and this could be in both plants and animals, um, well, I'm going to give you the example of the animal. But the organism literally breaks into little pieces or fragments, and then each piece would grow into a new individual. So a good example is Planera, and this is a flatworm. So if I come here to the middle, um, you've got the complete flatworm, and then it's going to break into pieces. And then on the head, on this case, will become a new organism. And here the tail will become a new organism, and the midpiece will become a new organism. So from the one, once it reaches the end of its life, or toward the end of its life, it will then develop into three new organisms. In plants, um, that's called vegetative reproduction. Um, now, um, these are another two examples, budding and fragmentation. So like I said earlier, it could be in plants and animals. So if you want to use fragmentation for the animal, that would be fine. I'm not going to ask you to distinguish between plants and animals. I'm just going to ask you two examples. But you need to be able to explain it. So budding, uh, vegetative reproduction, good examples, strawberries and grass. I don't know if you've ever done any weeding in the yard, but grass, if you try to pull the grass, it's just strings and strings of grass and all the roots and soils flying everywhere. So strawberries, um, they can actually take the parent plant, send out little runners or horizontal stems, and each new little runner, it will develop an offspring plant, and then it will develop roots, and then that plant will then grow. So that's how it reproduces off of the parent plant. In animals, um, also with asexual reproduction, an unfertilized egg can develop into an individual and be identical to its mother. So that's another option of asexual reproduction. So that Unfertilized egg does not need to be fertilized by sperm. So here's some examples. We have bees in the insect family. Um, oops, excuse me. In animals, there are lizards, fish, and even amphibians. And I put this up here. I'm not going to ask you a question about it. But there's one species of lizards, the desert whiptail lizard, and where the entire population are females. So there are no males in that particular species of lizard. In asexual reproduction, you could have that also in eukaryotes. And that would be going through mitosis or mitotic cell division. A good example would be our skin cells. Obviously, we want uh, the offspring or the additional skin cells, the new ones, to be identical to the original. We don't want any variation. Variations would lead to mutations. So here's an example here is my original with my chromosomes, and by the time I go through mitosis, we've had this before, I will end up with two cells that are identical to the parent. Now, organisms that are genetically identical are called clones. So I'm sure you've heard of Dolly, the sheep. That was the first successful clone. And what they did, um, they did a process called enucleation, and that's simply removing the nucleus from a donor. They took mammary cells from another sheep, and then they combined them, and then they added a current the electrical pulse, and that began the process of something called cleavage. We're going to get to that later in the unit. But basically, it creates a blastocyst, and what it does, these cells will then start developing into the tissues that will eventually lead to a complete organism. And again, I'm not going to ask you any questions about this, except the fact that what are clones. And okay, now chromosome numbers. Uh, each species does has their own, do have their own set of chromosomes. 
definitely make sure you know that humans have 46. Uh, these other numbers, don't worry about. I'm just putting it up here to just show you the extreme of all the numbers and how some are the same. Um, as of what scientists know now, there's a particular fern, and it has the greatest number of chromosomes at 1260. Uh, the greatest number in mammals is a particular rat at 102. Plants can vary, well, besides the 1260, um, 216 all the way down to 8. Your cat has 38, the dog has 78, and even a little ant could have two chromosomes. So if two or more species have the same number, they are still different organisms because it's how the genes are arranged. So I threw up some examples here, the 78, we talked about the dog, but also a chicken, a coyote, and a dove. Obviously, those are completely different organisms, and it's because those genes are arranged in a different order. So you can see here that there is some variation. And there is a myth that if you have organisms with the same number of chromosomes that you can breed them. That's not always the case. Obviously, you don't want to do any breeding between these species. But if they are close enough and the gene arrangement is close or similar, you could um, make those species. Prokaryotes. They usually, usually, there's always an exception. Uh, they usually only have one chromosome. And the shape of the chromosome is in a circular pattern. So here's an example. This is a bacteria. It's a general image of it. And you can see here the bacterial chromosome makes a ring or a circular shape. Now, I mentioned that there are some exceptions. Uh, the bacteria that causes Lyme disease does have 17 chromosomes. And they are the shape is linear, which means they look a lot like a eukaryote chromosome. So eukaryotes, their chromosomes occur in pairs. And they are, like I said before, linear shaped. Now you do need to know this. Make sure you know this. Two chromosomes of a pair, they are called homologous chromosomes or homologs. I've also heard this pronounced homologous. So homologous chromosomes, tomato, tomato. Um, they are similar in structure and genetic function. The accept, acceptance would be exception, excuse me, would be sex chromosomes, which, like for example, the male would have a long chromosome and a short chromosome would be the pair. Uh, the two for the female would be the same size. But everything else occur in pairs, and those are called autosomes. And there's some reading in your uh, online textbook that talks about that. Tetrad, and these are found just in a few organisms, they are a pair of homologous chromosomes that are joined together. And so you would be looking at four individual chromosomes. Now, chromosome number does differ. So asexual reproduction, the number is maintained through the process of mitosis. In sexual reproduction, we're going to have that number. Um, so we're going to talk about the process of meiosis. There are some similarities, and I'll point this out when we go over that particular lecture. But what's going to happen is it will have half the number of chromosomes for the sex cells. So the male would have half, the female would have half. And then when they come together and restore that genetic information, the two nuclei would unite, and that union is called a zygote. So when the two nuclei unite, it is called a zygote. So in Greek, it actually means to marry. So think of the union of marriage as a gamete means to marry. So the sperm is the male gamete, the egg is the female gamete. Now, I'm not going to ask you to label this diagram or redraw it, but I do want to point out the difference between haploid and diploid and make sure you know and you can explain this. So if I start with, let's start with the two individuals here, the male and the female. So the female is going to produce eggs through the process of meiosis. And when she does that, she is producing a haploid cell, an egg cell. And so that means the chromosomes, there are 23 chromosomes. The symbol for haploid is N. So it has half the number of total chromosomes. The male is also going to go through meiosis, and he's going to produce half the number, or a haploid, and that is 23 also. Now, when the egg and the sperm nuclei unite, we said that was a zygote, 
through the process of fertilization, it's going to restore the number of chromosomes to 46. That is the diploid number, and the symbol is 2n, twice the number. So after that has happened, it's going to go through mitosis, create new cells, development, and then the outcome would be two new individuals. And again, I'm not going to ask you to label this diagram. So gametes contain one of the chromosomes from the homologous pair of parents. Haploid, and I already went over this, but at least it's in writing now. Haploid is single, represented by a lowercase n. Diploid, two, symbol is 2n. Now some plants could have more sets, but we're going to focus on haploid and diploid, especially dealing with humans. That's going to be our focus. So when you have the union of the two haploid nuclei, sperm and the egg, is going to restore the cell to the tip diploid chromosome number. So this is the one thing I would ask a short answer on. So meiosis produces, keyword, the haploid or the N chromosomes for a reproductive cell, that could be sperm or egg. Through the process of fertilization, it's going to restore to the full diploid to N number. So if it's a short answer, make sure you have the two key terms, meiosis fertilization. These terms produces and restores and then talk about haploid and diploid. And so we'd have 23, 23, egg and sperm, and it's going to restore it. And so now we have a total of 46. So as always, please go back, review your notes. This quiz, you will not have the option to use your notes. There are no notes for this particular quiz. So I will see you later.